So I will speak on uh, everything that we want to bring up tonight. Uh, we can use A Course in Miracles because this is A Course in Miracles meeting, but if anybody here is from a different tradition and you'd like to bring in thoughts and questions from anything, uh, one that really doesn't, uh, it, it's like the top of the mountain. Uh, when you get to the top of the mountain, the, the peak experience, uh, all the roadways that seem to get there are just uh, gone. So there's not, it's not like you make it to heaven and then you, you tell your war stories. Oh, let me tell you how I got to the top of the mountain. Uh, the way, in the Song of Prayer, Jesus says that when you make it to the top of the ladder, then the ladder disappears. So it's, this is a journey without distance to a goal that's never changed. And when you get into the divine love, then you'll forget the journey. You won't have, uh, it's almost like reverse amnesia. Uh, to believe that you're in a world of duality and separation, you have to have an amnesia where you literally have forgotten the oneness of heaven, the song of love and gratitude of heaven. So now this Holy Spirit is turning the tables and saying, let's do a little reverse amnesia on the ego. We're going to remember the love of God and forget everything else have an amnesia about all the seeming trials and struggles and tribulations and just remember all the bliss and the joy and the happiness. And it takes a thorough training of your mind to do this. So we're not trying to say that we're not talking about a pie in the sky philosophy or just affirmations, but we're looking at exposing the ego so deeply that you start to see that it's a crazy belief system and that no one in their right mind would believe in the ego. <laughs> and that's why, you know, a lot of times, you know, I talk about ideas like, pretty radical ideas, like sickness is a decision. That seems like a pretty radical idea. But, and people do ask me the question all around the country and the world, you know, well, if sickness is a decision, then who in their right mind would choose to be sick? And I said, you've got it. <laughs> no one in their right mind would choose to be sick. Sickness is an unconscious uh, decision. It's a belief that somehow it serves you. And the more you go into it, the more you see that that just can't be believed. And yet this world is filled with fool's gold, lots of different empty roads that you can pursue for a while. And then when you get to the end of them, there's nothing there. It's just another dead end. At this point, you can either surrender and say, show me a different way, or the ego will say, well, you just didn't try enough paths. So that's trying to do more, and it's always trying to keep you on a wild goose chase. Seek and do not find is the ego's path of salvation. And the Christ mind, or the oneness mind, is saying, seek and you shall find. And that's the peace and joy and love of God. So, like I always say, when I come together in these gatherings, I never plan anything to say. I just, I show up with just a willingness to be truly helpful, and then... Uh, it's the questions and it's the ponderings of everyone together because we all have the Holy Spirit in us, in our hearts. And everybody already has all the answers. But they've just been so buried and covered over with all these unconscious beliefs that when we come together, really what we allow is permission in a sense of joy and safety to allow the questions to come into mind. If you keep questioning the ego, eventually it will unravel and you'll see that it's not even there. But the ego made up an entire cosmos so that you would question the cosmos, question, try to figure out the world, figure out how things, why, why do bad things happen to good people, try to figure out why did this happened to me, you know, that's the old favorite, why me? In terms of something in the world, why did this event happen? Why did I dream of this? And what does this color mean? And all dream interpretations and, and studying the world, you know, the science, the physics and everything, trying to discover answers. But this world is like a giant hall of mirrors or a giant smoke screen that was made up by the ego so that you wouldn't discover that who you are is Christ, that who you are is the one. So this whole world is full of distractions. And whenever you try to figure it out, you're really just trying to figure out the impossible. This world will never be able to be figured out. Um, how could you figure out duality and separation? Uh, oneness doesn't have anything to do with duality and separation. I spent 10 years in college, in undergrad and grad, 
studying every discipline known to man, kind of like the Renaissance guy who goes and, and studies the whole thing, from the conservatory of music, art, engineering, philosophy, psychology, sociology, all the way across mathematics, physics, calculus, da 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 da, only to start to discover that each discipline had its own assumptions and that no two professors, no two disciplines agreed on anything. That there was no universal agreement. There was lots of fighting, a lot of conflict, a lot of we know it, you don't. The psychologists and the scientists, physicists do not see the same world. And even those that are close, like the sociologists and the psychologists, have very, very different assumptions about the nature of the world and reality. So I was grateful to have studied all those years of college just to realize that none of my professors had the answer that I was looking at. And they were always conflicting with each other, just like countries conflict and neighbors conflict. And everybody's conflicting because no two people see the same world. And in the end, that's why you have to go really deep in your mind because you will not find the truth in persons, places, things, and disciplines. You could probably feel it when you were listening to that music. <laughs> Your heart chords <laughs> were resonating because you can recognize the truth and that music was not of this world. <laughs> and Petra joined in, if you heard the heavenly angels uh, joining in in this room here, it, it was so beautiful because this is coming, a, a, this is a communication that's coming from way beyond this world and it's, it loves us so dearly. And it's just this gentle wake-up call of saying, it's time to wake up. It's time to let go of your slumber and to really feel what the joy is about. So I, I do this full time. I mean, I've been traveling around just doing these uh, enlightenment gatherings or um, gatherings about love and oneness and truth for about 13 years now. And every experience is brand new for me because we, of the purpose why we come together. There's no uh, repetition in now. <laughs> and I am just so honored to be here with you and to go into this. And as usual, I always say I just open it up to um, any questions you have, any ponderings about the way I live or issues that are going on in your life. Uh, I One time I was guided to speak up at the, at the Quad Cities where, up on the Mississippi River. And I was supposed to be there, and I knew three months in advance I'd be going. And by the time I got up to the Quad Cities, uh, up near Davenport, Iowa and everything, the Mississippi River had flooded over its banks. Mm. And the town where I was to speak, uh, half of the town was underwater. Mm. And so I got there thinking that there may be a question about water, <laughs> or, mud, or, or Noah, or something. <laughs> But you know, when I got there, I was there for a whole weekend, and they asked thousands of questions, and not one person mentioned the flood. Okay, the perennial questions, sickness, death, relationships, you know, these are like perennial questions that have been asked for centuries and centuries. They were not in the least bit interested in talking about their city underwater. Uh, they had much more important questions to be asked, uh, than water flooding a town. So that just gave me, you know, when I drove in, I was driving over the bridge and I could just see this huge river had swelled and I could see this city, you know, half underwater, but the people didn't care, you know. They wanted to talk to me about sickness and death and relationships. So. Um, you know, any other topics, uh, including uh, relationships, seems to be very mysterious in this world. And uh, we were talking at dinner about uh, children as being reflections of mind, and we got into all kinds of things. And so I throw it open to you if you have anything that you'd like to uh, delve into as far as the topic and the way it goes. Um, I listened to you yesterday, and I really thought you were um, I'm like 100% with you and I go to another church as well and I was 100% with him as well and I'm having this as you probably already said it I have like this struggle to make to flip that coin over it's like I want to almost like say well here's my bag and my credit card and I got everything I need here and I want but uh, and then the worry comes in and then trying to figure out the world or 
I should be getting that career job, which is never going to happen. And I'm listening to the news, and it's just worse and worse and worse. And yet, at the same time, I'm 100% with where you're coming from. I should be there, and I want to be there, but it's like something inside, like you said, like when you're sick, the right mind. The one in the right mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like, it's, it's just not, it's almost like when somebody just kick me and sort of you know, so, <laughs> just say that's it. You don't have a choice. Just do it. Yeah. You're talking about a leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was that's what I was going to say. And, and, and um, like yourself, I was actually kind of wondering about yourself. I mean, I'm sure you're very talented. You could probably go get a job and do whatever. But that's what I'm finding is that there's like it seems like, and I don't mean to be negative. But I actually want to continue with what you're doing. But you know, there's there's things that seems outside when I perceive the world that. Uh, those things are being taken away, jobs are being taken away, housing, medical, things like that. And then, you know, I want to kind of be carefree, but at the same time, I feel like I'm being kind of responsible not thinking about it, too. You know, taking the concern for myself. But it's going too far to where it's more, always worrying. So, yeah. how do you, I mean, besides that, the faith, is there another way to look at that? Perhaps trying to say, you know what? Maybe you already said it. <laughs> but that seems to really, you know, it's getting in the way. Yeah, what you're bringing up is the thought of, of yeah, the thought of worry too. Just it, you're contemplating a, a turning over of your life. I mean, Christians sometimes talk about born again experiences. But that's what it is really. It's it's all it's a radical. Well, it's like I was already. <laughs> maybe 20 years ago actually but for some reason I decided to just kind of go just go with the flow don't create any disturbance just kind of you know influence little people here as I can here and there and just <coughs> witness more you know and now it's kind of come to the point where maybe the things you talk about these changes that are that are, we're getting more changes it's like I'm not seeming to have a choice I'm being kind of forced into making that you know and I'm like, I'm scared. Yeah. Like, that's a, that's a church, he said, white knuckle. You know, you just kind of... Well, you brought up a good question. We can really go into that. Because I think... I mean, I'm sorry if that wasn't the most positive subject. But. Oh, no, it's beautiful. In fact, I think it's a it's an important subject. In fact, you know, when I first agreed to come here, Robin and I exchanged a few emails because she was sharing a lot of the same things that you're sharing. You know, she yeah, said, I have a husband, exactly. I have children, yeah, and question. with the ones that are... I mean, I was admiring, you know, that, that about you and her yesterday, that was like, wow, how, how are these guys doing this? You know, why can't I do that? You know, I could probably come up with the resources. And I, I mean, I can do it. I can actually do some of the things that I want to do for a short period. I have the ability, but I'm just scared. And I'm like, well, that's not the right thing to do. That's not the responsible thing. But when I go out and I'm looking for jobs today, I'm getting shut down right and left, and I shouldn't be, and I'm hearing things are going to get worse. And, you know, it's like, um, I, and then I, I kind of I'm taking it out on myself. It's not right. Yeah, so I'm not able to help myself either. I just want to add in something real quickly. Um, you're in that pondering stage, and I think you said you had done it before once, and you're kind of back into the pondering stage. Yeah. And I know I pondered it for probably very seriously about six months, and I didn't even know it was but I knew that there was this restlessness in me that was coming up, and it. It was just one day, finally, the pondering was done. It wasn't even, it didn't even really feel like a choice. It was just done. And I went in and I talked to my husband and I said, I'm going to stop doing my work today. I don't know what that means because I don't really know what I'm going to do tomorrow. But, and it just stopped. It, because you felt like you were kind of being so depleted. That right. That well, no, 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 no. Not out of depletion. It was out of, I wanted to serve. You had more of a choice. I wanted to serve it. And same as what you're experiencing. I was, at that point, I had my own recruiting business for my home so I could be around my kids, and the recruiting was going down, down, down. And I was doing really great for a couple of years, and as soon as I started pondering, it's like the, I took the energy out of it. And so it, and so all of a sudden I had a really good reason because I was really walking away from, like, nothing at some point. And so I guess I, I created a convenient transition for myself, but it just happened. And I know I, I, I went down and sat on the floor in Terry's office and like, it was February 23rd, 2002. I'll never forget. I just sat there and said, this 
I can't, I can't do this anymore. Not that I can't. I just, I don't. It doesn't fit. And so they're not pondering state. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't think I. I was going to say I actually have a list of stuff to talk with her tomorrow about. The the big list. Well, some people do it more gradually. You know, where you keep your job. I'm prepared. You know, because I'm not working, and at the same time, going back into it, it's not serving the purpose. And maybe the staying in this area is not serving the purpose anymore. So. I might think this, this leap of faith is almost like jumping off a cliff. Like, well, I think I got a parachute on me, you know, but I need to jump. And it's so, I'm, you know, I admire you, and both of you. Well, I, I, I need to prove it. I guess I had to prove it to myself. I, you know, I had faith all my life, and I, I wanted to trust, but I wanted to really understand trust. It's easy to trust when you have something in your hand. You know, right. it's the unseen, and so I think that was just a phase I wanted to move through myself. So, means yeah. yeah. considering or thinking about, But one thing I want to say is that that the Holy Spirit <laughs> is the one that is the is the how, and the Holy Spirit is the thing that ignites the whole thing. And it's like you take your just your tiniest little bit of willingness along with the might of this light that's in your mind. And this light is powerful. You know, it can do more than move mountains. In fact, that's, mountains are kind of tiny for it. <laughs> All the spheres and the planets, you know, the whole cosmos, the energy behind the movement of all that is, gives you a little bit of an idea of how powerful this light is in this mind. So mountains are like two little dimples. <laughs> but what I'm going to say is that the Holy Spirit will reach your mind where you believe you are. So you will never be given anything that is beyond what you can handle. And what that means is, is that the Holy Spirit will uh, gradually, as Robin said, loosen your mind from these false concepts and beliefs. Uh, nothing gets ripped away. And in fact, you know, in the Course, Jesus says, don't be afraid that you're going to get hurled into reality. <laughs> and that's a very interesting phrase, hurled into reality. Because it would be like, uh, let's say you go to a movie theater and you're watching a movie, and you know how it takes a couple minutes for your eyes to really adjust to the darkness. You get in there and the previews have already started, and you you got to walk in there, and you have to stand back a little bit for a while, even if the lights are down at the bottom, because you'll just stagger and run into you know seats and everything if you try to just plow down there. So it takes a little while for your eyes to adjust. And then when you're in that movie theater for a while, your eyes become very adjusted to that movie theater. So much so that if in the middle of the movie, if you got up and you went right out the exit door and it was a blazing sunny day, that sunlight would actually hurt your eyes because that would be too great of a transition from a dark theater to a bright, bright sunny day. And, the, and that's a great metaphor for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not going to yank you out of a dark theater, a dark dream of separation and into the blazing light of, of reality because it would be absolutely too frightening. And everyone who believes they're here in this world is afraid of that light. If, if, even though we've grown to seemingly evolve beyond uh, punishing views of God to views of a loving God, let me assure you that if you still have irritations and annoyances mm -hmm. and struggles in your life, that subconsciously there's a deep-seated belief in, a, in an angry, vicious God. But even though God has nothing to do with anger or viciousness, the Holy Spirit's got a real convincing job to teach this mind that God is just pure love, like the prodigal son story, mm -hmm. and will welcome you back at any instant, completely, no questions asked. That's what I feel like, but I was saying, like, actually, on my 46 when I was good, almost 25 years ago, I had a very heavy experience with the master and the north, and uh, then after that, I thought, that's it, you know, I came kind of like, with, I'm going to keep my eyes as wide open as possible, I've got it, and I'm going to do it, and it just is like coming back now to it, but all this time later, and I don't know, just, just like reevaluate, but it's like totally, I'm not the same person anymore. I'm like about this big compared to that big. <laughs> yes. And when the fears and worries come up, which also adds to it, you know, what happens to it. I should be more comfortable with all this. Yeah, when the fears and worries come up, which is what you're sharing, as you approach this real turnaround in your mind, uh, that's what's going to happen. In other words, 
the fears have been pressed down for a millennium down into the mind. Uh, from a longer, like a reincarnational perspective, you might say that this darkness has been buried so deep that these seeming lifetimes just keep playing out over and over as opportunities to let this darkness be dissolved away, gently. And so what's going to happen is, is as you begin in this journey, the fears are going to come up, and that's exactly what happened when I was feeling like a calling to uh, impelled really to go out and start to share my joy and my experiences, I still had doubt thoughts. I still had thoughts of just like you're describing. What you do it for a month or a year and then what? Yeah. Survival, what? future, future or something. health insurance, yeah. life insurance, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mental plan, exactly. I mean, we can get into the specifics yeah. of exactly what comes up. There's all possible things though. There should be good things to think about, but it's like, it's, it's a, like you said, it's not happening. And when you think about it, you become obsessed about it. So, what do you do? Uh, well, put it this way. Jesus gives you a course, and it's a very practical course. In fact, uh, the only reason he gave you the text was so that it would make the workbook lessons more meaningful. Uh, that, that text is not to turn into the like, scribe from the Pharisees, where you can memorize uh, 31 chapters and go around and quote verse and, and, and text and, you know, sentence and this and that. And now, you know, with the second edition, they actually numbered all the sentences and paragraphs, so you know, almost a temptation there for the Bible book for us to go around and have the whole thing. You know, it's the workbook uh, that's the transformation tool. I mean, that workbook gives you one short lesson a day uh, just to apply. And he basically says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a workbook, one lesson a day for 365 days in the year. Uh, this workbook is perfectly designed for you. Uh, it assumes that you're not awake already. It assumes that you have fear and doubt. It assumes that uh, you're not ready to go off the deep end. Uh, you're ready to just start swishing your toes around in the baby pool uh, when you get to lesson one. You know, it's, it's perfectly designed by, I call it, the master psychologist who knows your mind so well, better than you know yourself. He, he knows you that, that well. And he's going to give you a step-by-step -step, uh, transformational program in which he simply says, just don't do more than one lesson a day. Don't try to sit down and, you know, do the whole package and eat all the whole box of crackers at one sitting. <laughs> one lesson a day, and as best you can, try not to make any exceptions to the lessons that are presented. And it's, he knows that you're going to skip practice periods. He knows that you're going to have difficulty doing what he's asking you to do. He may ask you to do something three times a day or five times. He knows you're going to miss some times. Uh, don't beat yourself up about that. He, this is designed to just go ahead, do the best you can, move on. If you have a particular lesson that really is meaningful and you feel like the, the Carol King song, I feel the earth move under my feet, <laughs> uh, and you say, I want to hang with this one a couple days, that's fine. Remember, he said just no more than one lesson a day that you can hang with a particular lesson if it's extremely meaningful for you. And as best you can, try not to make exceptions because he knows those fear thoughts are going to come out and he knows those doubt thoughts are going to come up. And that's the purpose of actually the beginning lessons is to, to loosen up the crust down there and let those things come up. So when I first started doing this, I had those thoughts that you're describing come up big time. And I... How big time? So big time that I pondered whether it was, you know, should I really take this step? I mean, I'm being compelled to travel, but I have no affiliation with the church or with an organization. Right. I can't call back to central office and say, uh, 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 the, credit, the debit card, uh, my, my debit card got refused, send me another one out. No way. It wasn't like uh, the Catholic Church where you've got millions of dollars stashed somewhere and you can send it out, send it out to the missionaries. Um, also, I didn't have, you know, CDs, money markets, I had no stocks and bonds, I had absolutely nothing. Uh, to go on, except faith, and that's what you were talking about when you started this center. Literally, you needed five thousand uh, dollars just to get going, and that five thousand and five showed up, right. and off you went. And the same with me when I hopped in that car the first time. I mean, I I went traveling, and I was stopped at a church the first stop, and I was given a, a Urantia book. 
a huge book um, by a psychiatrist who said, just read the last section. That's the only one that would be helpful to you. And I had that on the trip. I went the second night out. I was with, at a campground, and I heard this blind man singing and just belting out all these beautiful sounds, and I felt like I was at an opera. Uh, even though I was staying in the campground for like $10 a night. And the third night out, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, I, was, I came into the last five minutes of the Course in Miracles group, and they were arguing about sexuality. It was a very heated argument. And I just walked in there in the last five minutes, which took a lot of gumption just to walk in in the last five minutes of a meeting. But, but the Holy Spirit said, get in there. And I walked in, and then after the argument, they... The class ended and they said, they go up to me, I'm kind of embarrassed. We don't always do this. We don't always talk about this and this and that. And then they invited me to lunch and I went out with them and then they invited me to, this guy invited me to his house and then he said, let's do a Course in Miracles potluck. You seem to know what you're talking about. I mean, and I, there I was that evening, third night out on this houseboat in, on a lake in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'd never been to Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, eating watermelon, spitting seeds of watermelon out with the moon shining, and it was surreal. And we were talking, we got into this deep heart-to-heart talk. And I thought to myself, oh my God, is this what my life is going to be like? And then, at the end, when the boat finally came in, uh, and then they said, well, it's Sunday night, we've all got to go to work tomorrow, but you can stay on the houseboat as long as you want. And I had never met any of these people. Five minutes in the course of miracles meeting. And so what I experienced was I had a lot of fear coming up. And basically I told Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to knock my socks off uh, for me to do this. Because I've had a lot of training and education that says you've got to be practical and prudent and you just don't do these things. You're a fool. You're a gullible. You're, you're an idiot to think you can go out there. And those are the kind of thoughts I face. So I, that's a good prayer to give the Holy Spirit. To say, knock my socks off. It's your job uh, to convince me. I've got my little willingness here. Now, give it to me with both barrels. And when you ask the Holy Spirit for this, better watch it. I mean, I better say, when you, when you call the Holy Spirit for miracles and you say, knock my socks off. Because the Holy Spirit's been waiting for millennium for you to say that. You can hold back. Rolling back all the big angels, the legions of angels are all swirled there ready to go to give you that standing ovation. So, so that's one thing. Now the other thing is, is I had to meticulously do the lessons. In other words, I was talking when I spoke uh, the last couple of days about lesson 50 and lesson 76. Lesson 50 says, I am sustained by the love of God. And Jesus gets into all the particulars. He said, in this world, you believe you are sustained by everything but the love of God. Pills, money, protective clothing, knowing the right people, being light. Oh, give it to me straight. He said, boom, 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 boom. You, know, you believe in all these things. Uh, then he gets into 76. You know, you believe in laws of nutrition, uh, the laws of friendship, the laws of economics, the laws of medicine. He'll give it to you straight. He says, you believe in these things, and you need to start questioning these things. And if you just do these lessons, I've already got the structured program for you. You don't even have to work your, figure out how you're going to do it. I'll do it for you. You just give me that little willingness every day to do these lessons. So that's really practical, too, because, you know, like, for example, money. In this world, money seems so, so valuable because it's so exchangeable for so many Goods, services, money, shelter, time, everything. Uh, and, and he calls it uh, green paper strips and metal disc. I mean, absolutely, you know, just like it's nothing. And now if we update the course, we put the little plastic cards in. <laughs> because those little plastic cards seem to be, you know, the source of a lot of worry and stress. You know, too much in there, not enough, got to cover my balance, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if you start to do the lessons, what will happen is you'll start to have people work with the beginning lessons, their dreams change, and I've talked to people. Uh, Rich has been saying just since the last 24 hours to 48 hours, yeah. that her whole life has completely turned around. She bought her husband tonight, and the kids, and the animals, or even everything. I mean, everything is touched by these miracles. And, and I've talked to a number of people that have been saying, you know, that's how powerful it is. Now, the next thing I want to say, too, is when I started doing this, 
And I started traveling. The biggest block that I had was pride. You know, they talk about pride and vanity. I was raised with the Protestant work ethic. I was raised that you don't, t don't take a handout from anybody. You go out there and you work for every penny and, and you do like everybody else does. And so here I am, I turn my life over to God, I, I'm out on the road, and people start offering me things, and I've got so much pride, uh, <laughs> they even accept That's uh, what's offered for me. So, so number one was the Holy Spirit was saying, I'm the one giving you these things. <laughs> I had to listen to the Holy Spirit and say, it seems like it's people donating money to start a center or, or giving you, here, here's a ride, come stay at my house. Uh, this guy who, who let me stay on his boat, uh, he was a salesman, he said, here, I get all these extra samples. He gave me, you know, those little individually, those individual boxes of cereal? Mm -hmm. Check cereal. He gave me a box this high and this wide. <laughs> and if you've got some fears whether you're going to have enough food to eat on the road, it's kind of a nice symbol when somebody gives you a big box of check cereal. <laughs> so freshly wrapped and packaged to last you over a long time, almost kind of like, just in case, you're afraid you're going to starve to death. You open one little pot of check cereal. And, and the wife thought it was great. I thought this was not up from heaven, you know. And the woman who was traveling with me, she was like, Oh, cereal every day, David. And I'm like, hey, this is a, a symbol from God. <laughs> For somebody who's afraid they're going to start, you know, that was a good one. And, and I was given things along the way. In fact, she was sure that we had to stop and, and work along the way and get jobs and this and that. And I just said, hey, I've seen so many miracles. He's just going to knock our socks off. So just sit back and enjoy the ride. And by the time we were halfway through the trip, she called back, let go of her apartment, let go of her jobs. She just was so blown away by the miracles that mm -hmm. she just said, okay, I see, I give up. I mean, this is too much. And that's the good news about this. And so what I'm saying here is this isn't kind of a pie in the sky thing or kind of an ostrich buried the head in the sand. If you have commitments, responsibilities, if you have things that you've set in motion, uh, the Holy Spirit is not going to have you just abdicate and just drop the ball on those things. The Holy Spirit will work through you. And that's what happened prior to my travels was working with jobs, you know, becoming more humble, loosening the pride, and paying off student loans, and doing the things that you would imagine a, a God of integrity, a God of value would do. It's not going to have you just drop the ball on, on anything. And, and that's important to remember too, because the Holy Spirit will not yank the tablecloth out. You'll be told specifically, you know, what, what would be helpful to do, and he knows your doubt thoughts are going to come up. So, I share those things, Robin. Just a, a thought here where, when I was going through this, but when I was going through this myself, and it really brought up waves and waves of fear, but the one, I just kept going back to the chorus, I, I would keep flipping it open, and keep finding myself back into, I think, a, doesn't it say discernment is wisdom without judgment? Uh, and I use that a lot, and also, whenever you're making any decision, that if you just pick that, um, you know, the only right, right use of judgment is whether or not you're experiencing joy. So every time it would come down to making a decision, should I do this or should I do that? You know, should I put this money down on this property, or should I make sure I have enough to cover my kids? What, you know, it's like there was always these decisions where I felt like I was stuck in the middle because... You don't, you don't know what's going to happen in a week, and you don't know where things are going to come from, and you kept thinking, right, and, you know, and, and you, when you're in that place of what feels like paralysis, it's like nothing happens. So you have to stay in this flow, but if you just do that which brings you the least amount of fear at the time, whatever that is. And so sometimes I would kind of veer this way, and I would kind of go back into my, my material world and take care of things there, and then I kind of veer back this way. And if you can just, every time if you just ask what brings me either, sometimes the two decisions both seem fearful. So it's not like you can just go, well, what makes me feel most peaceful? Well, neither one makes me feel peaceful, you know, when you're in the middle of it. And it's whatever brings you the least amount of fear at the time sometimes is the criterion. And, and that's what seemed to just kind of gently bump me along. To, <laughs> and I would get these gentle corrections 
you know, and, and there's so many decisions that get made when you're in that process of surrender and, and the undoing, and it feels like things are just falling away, but they are, but it, 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 initially it feels scary, it feels painful, because it's things that you've created, and all of a sudden they're, they're not there, or they're gone, I mean, even when your house is gone, I had never experienced my house needing to sell my house. And it's especially with the, with the period that after you worked hard for something and you right. froze it for a long time. And then you go, oh, did like, this do do this wrong? Am I doing this too fast? Yeah. And there's all these questions yeah. and yet as I as I as you move through it you start to see it's just kind of this undoing. And it, you know, the thing about faith is it doesn't require faith when something's in your hand. Well, faith is in the unseen. So as your foot kind of leaves the stone, as you're leaping onto the next stone, the faith is in knowing it's there. And so when you're up in the air, you, you just sometimes feel like you're you're sideways. And and you just the willingness, just I'm willing to know it's there. I'm willing to know you won't drop me. You won't let me fall. And I used to have these dialogues with Jesus in the parking lot at the post office. It seemed to be at night, nobody's there, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be at home. I had kids, and I started going out of the post office, and I said, well, I'm going to go check the mail, you know. I go to the post office, and we would just have it out in the car, and like, what is going on? Because everything seemed like it was being pulled away. So it just was funny to me that the grand opening's in the parking lot, you know, because <laughs> 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 